What have you done in the early days of the CRF to emphasize the science in your research? Uh, I know just the mapping of the cave itself. Some people don't think it's science. I, I do because I think you need to have have the mapping to, to, to know know what's going on as the basis of everything else. But What we pointed out was that the map is the basis for all science because if you're going to look at the cave crickets in a part of the cave, how are you going to describe where in the cave you found the cave crickets? Was it near a valley wall? Was it under the cap rock? What? Well, if you don't have a map, you, you have no idea. So every kind of study uh, depends on having a map. Every archaeology study certainly does, because on the map you locate the artifacts, right? So, uh, well, the second thing we did was to recruit onto the board of directors people like Will White and Tom Polson back before they were doctors. <laughs> In other words, they were graduate students who looked like they and Patty Jo Watson was one of these. Well, these people became prominent in their own field. Will White uh, became the principal person in uh, karst uh, uh, geohydrology. And uh, Patty Jo Watson was kind of the queen of archaeology in this country for a while. Uh, and Polson who was finishing up his degree at Yale, uh, prior to his work, most of the biology was done in taxonomy, that is identifying stuff, putting a pin through each one and putting it in a cabinet. Uh, he looked at predation, that is who's eating who in the cave. So he worked out some of the early predation chains in cave animals. The uh, beetles that ran around on the sandbank were always looking for cricket eggs. The crickets would lay the eggs in the sand with an ovipositor, and the, cricket, the, the, the beetles would hunt around for these eggs, and if they found an egg they could live for a month or more on one egg. <laughs> so the presence of cave crickets on the ceiling and uh, beetles on the, on the sand uh, was a synergy that you found almost all the time wherever you went in the cave. And that's why, because the predation was set. Well, Polson worked out a lot of that earlier earliest study on cave animal predation. Uh, Rain Curl, he did stuff on scallops and supercritical laminar flow for involved with pit formation. No, that was Will White. Will White did that? I Will thought... White and John Hess. I thought it was Curl who did this. No, Curl worked on a variety of things, including the number of caves with no entrances. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm just getting people mixed up in my head. Like, I, 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 I met Rain Curl like at a bog meeting or something, but I don't really know. Will White, I used to go to the Nittany Grotto meetings a lot yes. when he was involved with that, and I've been caving with them. A number of times. Yes. So, so I know we'll like much better. Sure. <laughs> well, Will White. I was in the Air Force when I met John Stelmack and Will White and several people from State College, Pennsylvania. I, I had talked the Air Force into letting me write a book on um, motion picture uh, planning and production. See, after I'd been in the Air Force for a couple of years and making movies, I discovered that the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy were spending millions of dollars on research uh, related to movies. <laughs> but the people who made the movies were getting none of this information on their findings. So I said to 
uh, air inspector one day, I think we ought to write a book about what these people are finding and how that applies to movie making. I think we could make better movies if we knew the outcome of the research. Well, I, the air inspector disappeared and a couple of months later orders came in that I was to be detached to write a book. <laughs> and uh, the commanding officer of the squadron was furious. He said, called me up and said, Brecker, what the hell are you trying to pull here? This sounds like a gold brick operation if I ever heard one. So I gave him the same spiel that I gave to the air inspector and I said, they want me to write a book to help everybody make better movies in the Air Force. I'll be going around the country interviewing the people who are doing this research. So anyway, I ended up at State College, Pennsylvania, and by that time I knew there was a grotto there, and I, I was talking to a Professor Lumsdane, who was uh, doing early research in communication. And he was, at the time, I was interested because he had authored some of the papers that were then uh, around about movies and communication and so on. Well, he was trying to set up a huge department of communication at Penn State. And after he talked to me, he wanted to recruit me as one of his early students to get a master's and a PhD in communication. And I thought, boy, that sounds like a good deal. Here I am writing a book on the subject. And then I thought, what the hell? I've been practicing everything he's going to teach me for a couple of years now, <laughs> three years now, and here I am writing this book. I, I probably know as much about it as he does. <laughs> so I wasn't recruited, but I could have gotten a PhD in communication. Did you finish your book? Was it ever published? Yes, the Air Force published it. Uh, it uh, it was a comprehensive book about motion picture production technique. I, I had a gifted composer who wrote the part about movie music and what kind of music is effective in not subtracting from the content of the movie, but rather reinforcing the emotional uh, tone you want to set. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty good book. I guess I don't count it as my book because it was, in effect, work for hire. Uh, but I did get one copy of it. I don't know where the book is now. But... Do you remember the title of it? Yes. Motion Picture Planning and Production. All right, I was curious. It might be available online or something. Might be. Uh, it may be in the government archives somewhere. It's interesting you talk about the music, like you had the early silent films, and yes. they show them at the theaters, yeah. and, and they didn't have music with them, and so they'd often have a band there, and the band would, initially the band didn't play with the, with the, with what was showing on the picture, they just played popular tunes for a background music, regardless of what was being yeah. shown on the screen, it wasn't until like, Oh, like 1905 that they started like trying to match the what they're playing to what the what the music that's were. when they got the piano player in instead of the whole orchestra and then they got uh, uh, by about 1910 there was actually writing scores to be played by the bands <laughs> with, with with music but it took them like uh, from the first ones in the 1890s up to 1905 to figure out that yeah you could play music but that actually went with the pictures you were looking at. Yes. Well, uh, and the piano player could, if he was pretty gifted, he could vary the tempo with what was going on when the horses were galloping through the valley. It was up tempo and very fast, and when the, it was night, why things were kind of in the minor key. Yeah. Well, uh, 
it was important in in government films to not have the music dominate the whole thing. You don't want everybody tapping their feet and humming along uh, when the airplanes are coming in and dropping napalm. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that was that was uh, my final six months in the Air Force was writing that book. Hmm. Then after the Air Force you got involved in an, was an advertising firm? Yeah. It was right across the road from where we lived at the time. I had done moonlight work for them. Uh, shortly after we moved to Yellow Springs from New York City I got in a carpool with a couple of engineers who went back and forth to Wright Patterson every day. And one day one of them said, uh, I've got to introduce you to Dick Odeorn. He runs an advertising agency. And so he did the following Saturday and Dick Odeorn was building his house, laying concrete block. And, well, I had spent a lot of time in high school working for contractors, building concrete walls and mixing up mud and wheeling it here and there, binding, reinforcing steel together and demolishing buildings. And so I pitched in and helped him and told him my story. And I was working in a motion picture unit. Well, he, during World War II, had, uh, was in a documentary army unit making uh, manuals uh, for uh, various equipment. And uh, so that's where he got into technical writing and uh, he had joined a technical agents, advertising agency in Boston and then married a woman whose home was Yellow Springs, moved out to Yellow Springs, Ohio, and started up a, an industrial advertising agency at a time when the only uh, ad agencies around were commercial agencies. So we gathered quite a string of machine tool builders and chemical equipment producers, electric motor manufacturers, other uh, other uh, companies that made stuff for business and industry. And we got, we got the accounts because we weren't afraid to talk to engineers. <laughs> and, you know, I had been making technical films for a couple of years. So Odearn said, well, we've got some brochures we've got to turn out. Uh, how would it be if I gave you one of those to, to write? And I did. And it, he used it all without very much editing, which I thought was kind of strange for a product called Tectum, which was a structural insulating material that you could make roof planks out of, uh, a sound absorbent or a sound deadener. And at any rate, he saw that I could write technical writing and uh, so he said, well, uh, the minute you get out of the Air Force, you've got a job here. So off and on, I did freelance work for him while I was in the Air Force. Joined the agency after I got out and remained in the agency for about 40 years. Ended up owning the agency and giving it to the employees when I retired. What was the name of the agency? Odeorn Industrial Advertising, OIA. It's still around uh, under the trade name OIA Marketing, but it's still a specialist in industrial and business to business advertising. Yeah, I saw the comments about you becoming the president in, huh. in uh, my research. Well, we've been talking quite a bit today. Why don't we just stop for today? You're, it's getting a little bit tiring. <laughs> yeah, you want to quit? Yeah. Okay. Well, 
there's a sofa you can spread out on. Zhenkai sleeps on that sofa. Well, you've got two sofas, that's good. Two people, two sofas, that sounds good. Okay. And I've got my, like I said, I've got my, uh, sleeping bag up in my car. I, uh, I had a long drive today, too, and, uh, <laughs> What's that? I had a long drive today and didn't sleep much last yeah. night. Oh, okay. Whenever I have to get, whenever I have to go someplace, I uh, I don't sleep the night before. Okay. You know, I won't get all hyper and can't I sleep. See. So I'm just kind of uh, ready for a break. Well, you're you're dredging up stuff I almost forgotten, but uh, I've uh, led a uh, kind of an interesting life. <laughs> Uh, there's still m stuff to talk about. We haven't talked about your uh, uh, WKU courses much. Yeah. If you've, you've mentioned them, uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the uh, Mammoth Cave and Flint Ridge explorations you've done and okay. stuff like that. Sure, uh, we can get into that. We haven't covered any of that material. We <laughs> talked about your Aunt Retta. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my Aunt Retta was, uh, as I said, my model and my uh, prototype. Maybe we have a chance to talk about some different individuals who are some with us and some aren't anymore. Okay. Uh, tomorrow. Hi, right, we're about to quit. Piano smashing. I told him about piano smashing. He's going to bunk out on that bed. Zenkai sleeps over <laughs> there. He's got a sleeping bag. and okay. uh, He won't need an air mattress. This, this is a very yeah, comfortable, comfortable couch. couch. And, uh, we'll have an extra large number of people staying here tonight. <laughs> and we'll, we can talk some about your writing experiences about Mr. Eben who Mr. Who? Eben who disappeared from the uh, writing the K the C3 expedition book. Oh. Yeah. Well, we got that guy fired out of the NSS. We, he was a charlatan and a <laughs> Yeah. Well, that that was an interesting story. We Smith and I decided we were going to run for the Board of Governors of the NSS and make sure that this guy who engineered all the publicity for the C3 expedition got fired out of the <laughs> vice presidency and out of the NSS if we could. He was uh, the kind of person who would uh, be in the front of the Bigfoot movement and uh, mm -hmm. uh, alien capture, uh, kidnapping, and that sort of thing. He was into pseudoscience of every kind. I know what you've written or said in your previous talks about how you ended up writing the the. Uh, Cape Beyond. In the paperback version of uh, that book, I laid it out in the new introduction, what really happened, and which Joe Lawrence came to New York to write the book and announced that he couldn't stay because he couldn't get off work. <laughs> well, I've always liked to uh, teach, and uh, I never had any courses in teaching, but it, just in the course of doing documentary and technical films and technical advertising, I, I uh, prize clear writing and uh, and communicating with people where they are in a way that they understand the main ideas of things. and. Uh, 
I think when you do that, you do people a great service. <laughs> uh, I know the people who I've been impressed with in caving are people who made things that were puzzling to me clear. And uh, I've always viewed communication in that same way. Sometimes you're communicating about something very simple and you can just wave your hands and teach some people. Other things are, are quite complex and they have a backstory and they have a forestory and they have a bunch of people who had the wrong idea. When do you bring that up? Do you bring that up? These kinds of issues have uh, motivated me uh, throughout my life because I've always, it, after I was in the Air Force for a while, I realized that I was a storyteller. And that storytelling is not a pastime and it's not a frivolous thing. It's a, it's a very important thing in this world. Uh, some of the people who changed the world for good have been storytellers. <laughs> uh, and while not all storytelling is the same, there are certain elements to it that, that go through all of it. And uh, so I've taught courses in technical writing and uh, environmental writing, and uh, I don't think I've ever taught a course in cave writing, but uh, caves set up a special uh, set of problems. And, and of course, I knew that in the beginning of writing The Caves Beyond. So you have to deal with these special problems in a way that makes sense to the reader, otherwise you lose the reader uh, quickly. So I've always enjoyed telling very complex stories and trying to simplify them to the point where most people can understand the story and perhaps even extrapolate it to wider applications. So I guess if there's a story in my life, that's it, is telling stories. And uh, trying to get better and better at it. Uh, and never really stop it. And teaching is really just telling stories to people and leading them to do things that will teach uh, them uh, what I would call viscerally deep understanding of what we're talking about. Uh, you know, this gets into my educational philosophy, which is that the teacher has an obligation to know how each student in the class learns. Some of us learn by visual media. Some people learn through our ears. Some people learn through reading. Other people only learn through experimenting. Other people can learn through examples. Uh, and most everybody has some combination in which they uh, learn best, learn quickly, and also some ways they're not very good at. So it's the teacher's obligation to figure out where each student is. <laughs> it's not the student's obligation to figure out the teacher so much as it is the teacher's obligation to figure out the student. So then if you're going to construct an educational experience, you have to see who you're teaching uh, know a little about them, what they want to do, not what they want to learn, but what they want to do when they get the information. So the first question that I asked all the students, both in marketing and in uh, speleology, was what do you want to do after you take this course? Don't tell me what you want to learn, but tell me what you want to do. It could be anything. I want to uh, 
survey a cave in my backyard or I want to be able to explain caves to other people. Uh, just tell me what it is you want to do so I can teach you to do that. And the important things you want to teach four or five different ways so that everybody or most everybody will understand. <laughs> not only understand, but be able to demonstrate it to somebody else. So a great many activities in this life, like writing, are considered to be lone wolf uh, applications of certain skills. So a lot of people consider writing to be a, a solitary skill. You have to learn to write. You cannot collaborate and write. Why is that? Well, because writing involves the ego and two strong egos cannot survive. They will hate each other and eventually kill each other. So don't collaborate. Well, most business writing today is done by committees. It's not done by individuals. Uh, in our advertising agency, we always had two or three eyes on every piece of copy before the client ever saw it. Why? Well, because several sets of eyes are better than one. <laughs> and this is not prima donna writing. This is not personal poetry. This is clear communication. Does this communicate clearly or is there a better way to say it? And you better be ready with the red pencil to correct things and fix things until they're clear. Uh, and no matter how complex it is, you can always explain it some way or another. Some ways are better than others. And But if you go to the individual student's background and understanding how they learn, then you're pretty well equipped to explain a lot of very complicated things, to explain some things that are just wrong. <laughs> uh, that, you know, for example, that creativity has to do with imagination. Well, I suppose there's a branch of creativity that may involve imagination, fantasy writing, for example, but most creativity is clarity. <laughs> uh, People who can say things simply and succinctly are very creative as far as I'm concerned. Uh, anybody can use a thousand words to shake their hands at you and, and explain things, but how many people can do it in seven or eight words in a way that you will remember it forever? And uh, the answer is not very many people. Well, that's what you strive for in creative writing is the ability to uh, inform everybody. <laughs> so that's been my goal in teaching marketing or teaching speleology or teaching you about adventures or even teaching you uh, a bizarre view of caves, which is what Ergor Rubrek does. Uh, and uh, it's not very many people can write a story in two pages. But the Ergor stories are two pages. Why, why not make a book out of it, said Tom Brucker. And I said, I could write a book tomorrow on this stuff, but I, I can't write an Ergor story in one or two days. It takes several sometimes a week to write an Ergor story because you read through it and you show it to somebody else and suddenly you discover they don't understand part of it. That's your fault, not their fault. <laughs> so I have a, a very strong set of ideas about communicating and writing that I feel very strongly about and would like to teach everybody how to do that. Uh, I know it's not my role in life to teach everybody everything, but uh, whatever I teach, I'd like to make it
clear to most people. Well, the purpose of language is communication of your ideas. It's not to show off how your command of yeah. ten letter words. No, it's connecting. <laughs> It's connecting with where people are at the moment with what information you think they need. And it may be the information you think they need is really not what they need, but you have to ask them, <laughs> what do you want to do when you learn this stuff? It was some famous person, but it's been attributed to a bunch of different people. It says that uh, if you can't explain your idea simply you don't simply don't understand it well enough to uh... well that's right I think that's true that is the clear understanding of the development of the sinkhole plane has come in bits and pieces over a long period of time sometimes involving understanding a piece of it Sometimes another piece, and sometimes how to fit how the pieces fit together. So I'm still learning how to describe it as I went through a synthesis with you. I was still shaking my hands around and not doing it very clearly. I should commit that to writing sometime, and it would probably interest a lot of people. <laughs>